Again, my name is Winston Earnhardt. I'm a consultant from Tunica County and work the northwest part of Mississippi. I was asked to give a talk on soybean production, so I thought we would start. Can you get this turned on where it's working? On well, exactly what a, what a soybean producer is as far as what his main purpose is. And as I started thinking about that, I, well, a soybean producer is actually in the energy business. He's in the energy transformation <laughs> business. Now, I know that when you think of that, you think of something more like this. This is at uh, about 20 miles north of my house. This energy company owns about a thousand acres. A lot of it's in soybeans. And they put this solar project in. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but we're going to make somewhat of an analogy of the soybean plant and what we're doing as a producer with this project here. Uh, I told you that the soybean farmer is actually in the energy business, transforming energy. Of course, I'm talking about from the sun through photosynthesis by using their leaves, producing, changing electromagnetic energy into chemical energy. And uh, there's two basic laws. I know this is very elementary, but you probably learned this in high school. But there are two basic laws dealing with energy that I think that we need to look at, and we're going to apply this directly to you as a soybean farmer if you are associated with that. The first one is uh, the first law of th thermodynamics, or the first law about energy in the universe is matter is neither created or destroyed, it only changes forms. Now, we as humans, we eat food, which is chemical energy. We convert that into mechanical energy, we lose a little bit as heat. The soybean plant has to abide by these same laws. It's taking in electromagnetic energy and uh, using that to make glucose. It turns that glucose into energy to carry on its functions. Uh, so that, that one is really not hard to understand. The second law, however, is hard to understand, and it is that entropy is always increasing. Entropy, another name for entropy, is disorder. And disorder is always increasing. Now, I tried to teach this in a college class, and... Uh, it was kind of hard to do, so I decided to come up with uh, an experiment, a lab project, so to speak. And uh, I wanted to use a celebrity in this lab project. It's, now, you've got to use your imagination a little bit. I contacted a lot of celebrities, and uh, every one of them turned me down until I called this guy. Let's see if you can recognize him. Y'all have ever seen him before. Well, Fred agreed to do the project, so I, I took Fred to the classroom and said, all right, here's what we're going to do. We took Fred out, stripped him down to his underwear and said, now, Fred, you stand right here, soak up the sun, and we'll see how you come out. Now, why did I choose Fred? Fred is a tremendous example of order. The latest publication on a human being said that they're made up of 37.2 trillion living cells. Think about that. In one of the textbooks in, of biology that I taught in college, in the introduction it says that each living cell is more complicated than a jet airplane. So as uh, he is a tremendous example of order. Well, we say, Fred, you just stand right there, and we'll check on you later. We come back the next day, and Fred's doing pretty good. I said, you're, you're doing all right, looks like. And uh, we come back a week later and check on him, and he's not doing so well. And uh, we come back a year later, and Fred is dead. And not only is he dead, but there's not much left of him. There's a few bones left on the ground there, but all of that order has what? Decreased, or the disorder has increased. 
Entropy is always, we have to fight that every day. The world has to fight that for survival. All living organisms fight it. Even our machinery has to fight it because order is decreasing in the universe. One of the universal laws, it's kind of hard to understand, but that's what, why we, as a soybean farmer, have to make sure that our plants survive and can produce food for the world with seven billion people in it. All right, where does, what did Fred need? What did he need? The, the, the class answers, well, he needed food and water. And I asked the next question, well, where, does, where do we get our food? And they said, Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> oh, uh, he needed a Big Mac. But really, we get, we get our food from the sun. We get our food from the sun. It drives the whole agricultural system is the sun. The sun is a huge object. It's made of about 70% hydrogen, about close to 30% helium. In the middle of the sun, there's a reaction going on called fusion where hydrogen plus hydrogen is being fused into helium. Hydrogen weighs one AMU, it's fused with another hydrogen that weighs one AMU, and you end up with helium which weighs two AMU. One plus one equal two. Not so fast. Albert Einstein said that when hydrogen plus hydrogen fuses to form helium, there's a little mass left over. Right there. And he said that that mass is converted into energy at this following reaction. Do y'all recognize the reaction? E equals mc squared. E is the energy that's coming down from the sun. M is the mass, the amount of mass that was converted. C is the speed of light. All that reaches the earth and uh, it's up to us as farmers to capture that and transform it into sugars and later into food. Now, how am I applying all of this science to you as, as a soybean producer? Well, I'm going to give you an example here. Let's see. Here's a uh, soybean farm about 20 miles north of Tunica. The beans are maturing out. They put a late irrigation on this field on the left here, and it was, might have needed it, might have not. But in light of what we've been talking about, and that is a pun, what's the problem here? They didn't can it. I'm going to make a statement, and some may take, may disagree with me. But if a farmer is renting a piece of dirt or buying a piece of dirt and he allows one square foot to soak up sunlight all summer and don't transform energy on that dirt, he's inefficient. He's losing productivity. I may get in trouble for saying this, but farmers that took prevented planting and let the fields lay out all summer long, we lost productivity from a natural resource. That light hit the soil all summer and there was no sugars produced. Matter of fact, you can say you're in the sugar business as well. You make glucose, that's what you do if you're a soybean farmer. That glucose is turned into your soybeans eventually. That's a group 3.8. It was planted on a clay soil, 30 inch rows. If you looked at my t the title of what I'm talking about, I'm talking about trying to select the right variety that matches your soil type, your farm, to where you can avoid something like this. Those beans cut about 45 bushels today on good, good land, it's land formed, irrigated. He cut 45 bushes today. 
down the road the same variety planted on 15 inch rows that looks a little bit more efficient all right the next one the solar project he had a thousand acres to build his project on and he squished them all up on that one little acreage do you see much wasted sunlight there is there much sun hitting the soil they understood the first and second laws of thermodynamics. The same, same farm that we showed you earlier on 30 inch rows, different, uh, this was a little better cotton land, 46, 32s, planted on 30 inch rows. They cut right at 80 bushels to the acre. Seven at seven point five inch spacing, planted flat on a clay, forty six thirty two. I thought I'd mention some weed control because I'm gonna talk about weed control here in a few minutes. This farmer on a sharky clay, this is dry land. Used authority elite and gramoxone pre, followed by roundup and prefix post. Had successful weed control. He averaged about sixty. Dry land. One of my farmers liked the twin, tri, uh, twin row planted on a 38 inch. It's very close in results to a 30 inch. But it's on a row and you could water down them. It was successful, had good canopy. A successful planting. Tight, 38 with twin rows. This had boundary and, uh, as the pre-merge. About 65, about 65 to the acre. Liberty Link, I think we'll see a lot more Liberty Link next year with the PPO resistance. I, I'm gonna show you, uh, that, well, we've, they've had to improve the genetics in Liberty Link. I think they're getting very close there with Roundup Ready, matter of fact, when you look at the Mississippi trials, even though they're not side by sides, you take the mean of the Mississippi Liberty Links group four, they're eight bushels better than the mean of the Roundup Ready group four. I'm just saying, if they're that sorry, how did that happen? And I'm gonna show you some yield drag on Roundup Ready here in a minute. And I, I apologize for if any Monsanto people are here. We've been very, we've made made a lot of good crops with Roundup Ready and a lot of people still can, but it's, uh, we have a, we're indebted a lot to that science. Liberty Link, this was on seven and a half inch spacing, flat. The yield monitor showed this cutting 65 up on the cotton land. He got down in the sharky clay and it turned to 45. But good canopy. I put this in here because uh, this farmer here is successful growing soybeans and irrigating them. They're on a 60 inch bed. I call that a watermelon row. He does that so he won't have to run water down so many furrows. And it does wick across when he's watering. But that was actually a 4632. I didn't, I didn't get the yield on that, but I just wanted to show you that. That's a good row pattern for making an early canopy. Now, I'm, I like an early canopy. It may not always out yield the one with the uh, more open canopy, but you're shading out earlier, shading out weeds, conserving moisture because you're in the shade. Uh, another item is temperature of the soil. It protects that soil from getting so hot if you shade out early so it just makes sense to me this next farmer is a zero grade farmer uh, he's planting his beans on 30 inch rows uh, this is an armor 51 r50 he was having trouble flooding these fields irrigating them he was doing more harm than he was good he was damaging the soybeans and I will tell you what he did. I'm going to show you here what he did. 
I'm not saying go do this. This is what he did, and I'm going to just tell you the results of it. He went in the middle of those 40 acre fields and put a little three tenths foot rise in the middle, a ridge across the, the 40 acre field. And it slants off 600 foot one way and 600 feet the other. He runs poly pipe down to that ridge and across and waters them down the road just like they were on one tenth in. A one tenth grade. And that way he's watering down the row and, and not you don't have that huge flood out there on those clay soils and have all of the anaerobic effects of over flooding. It's been successful for him. Now, and the rice, of course, it's, I, this is not drawn to scale at all, but uh, it, I drew it just to show you. Kind of, to look at it, it looks still flat, but it'll be shallow in the middle and a little deeper on the ends. We don't have any levees in the rice field. It works fine. Works fine. All right, that's about it on the, the varieties and row spacing and maybe over teaching how important it is to capture light. But the next section, you might get something from it. I've been in business and uh, consulting for 44 years and I farm for about 30 years and I've listed some of the more common mistakes farmers make. And some of these now, you're saying, well, that's so elementary, how could they make that mistake? You'd be surprised how smart some of my farmers are, and they make this mistake, some of these mistakes. The very first one, and I've already heard another consultant address this issue about two hours ago. Plant, planting in the weeds. My father told me don't ever plant in the weeds. And you'll say, well, who would want to do that intentionally? I'll tell you how they do it. They plant in the weeds and say, well, I'm going to get my burn down out tomorrow. And then they procrastinate and it's another day. And then they procrastinate and it's two more. They go out there and the rice is already up or whatever the crop is, it's already up in the weeds. And then they go to me as a consultant and they say, now clean it up. Clean it up. And that is... That is really one of the worst, I'm going to call it a sin, that a farmer can do. It's one of the worst things that can happen to you, and I can clean it up, but it really hurts the pocketbook. Now, that's not the only way. And this rice consultant that was talking earlier kind of stole this next statement that I was going to tell you. I love a Kelly Diamond and what it does. It is called a harrow. It's not a field cultivator, it's not a disc, and I know it costs $60,000 and the farmer wants to pull it. But it really does cut about that deep and throw dirt over weeds, lays them down and looking across the field, it's clean. And they go plant in that seed bed thinking it's clean. And then the next thing you know, they spring back up out of that dust and there's pigweed or something this tall that you plant it in. There's another instance where you put a burn down out. Now this happened to us in rice on Barnyard grass this tall, round up and sharpened, supposed to take it out. There was antagonism between the sharpen and the roundup. It didn't take it out. Some of that larger barnyard grass was burnt down and it tillered back about like a little ball and they planted the, the rice in it. So the barnyard grass had a head start. Sometimes they gramoxone, burn down with gramoxone and it doesn't kill all the mare's tail. So what did you do? You planted in the weeds. How many times I've seen this? All right, next thing, failure to scout the weeds. In other words, the farmers don't know they're out there. They don't know how big the pigweed are. We've been saying that if it's, uh-oh, let me go back. A two-inch pigweed is about it on reflex. And on Liberty, about a four-inch pigweed is about it for killing it dead. And if they get bigger than that, you just lose them. You wouldn't lose them in a liberty situation. You can defoliate them the rest of the year and make a crop with liberty. 
But in a Roundup Ready system, you've lost. This next one, misinterpret correlation data. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about there. I'll tell you what I'm talking about. These scientists know, I, you might know. Correlation means you notice something, you observe something, two things happening at the same time. And it's a great tool to direct your scientific endeavors. But I'm going to give you an example. That, and it, an example of this in, in marketing is, well, if you add my, we added my product to this well-known product and, it, and we made 70 bushels. Don't you want to buy my product? I'm recommending this product. There was no cause research, cause and effect research. It's absurd to make a claim based just on correlation. Now, I don't, I'm going to give you an example that a professor gave me in trying to teach this. There's a hundred percent correlation between, between people who use toilet paper and people that have anal cancer. Did the toilet paper cause the anal cancer? 100% correlation now. What did that tell you? Don't use toilet paper. No. The interpretation, the claims that could be made just because there may be a correlation. A, a woman has two sons. One, li one likes rice checks, one likes Cheerios. The guy that ate the rice checks grew six foot tall. The one that ate the Cheerios happened to grow four foot tall. Did the Cheerios stun his growth? You need to eat rice checks. It's the correlation, two things happening. And, and I promise you, it's not just farmers that fall for this. It's, it's the whole public sector. I've got a son that works for Harris, I mean Caesars, entertainment, marketing, way up in the company. I was talking to him about this and he says, we use that all the time in marketing. And they could be misleading some people. All right, let's go first. <coughs> Failure to maintain fertility, a lot's been said about that. I, uh, Randy Dowdy that talked about his 100 bushel soybeans. He spent about 80% of the time talking about fertility. And maybe 10 or 20% of the time talking about other ways to get 100 bushel soybeans. Fertility, fertility, fertility. This one. If anybody studies yield maps, they'll find where their swags are. It's the largest contributor to lack of limiting yield is swags. And we have the same ones every year, and they hurt yield every year. Now, we're getting a lot more land, land formed up our way, and I'm glad to see that. Timeliness, again. Timeliness. I don't know how to teach it. I beg, plead. What do you do, Tucker? Some have it, some don't. But it's important, and it's some of the one of the bigger mistakes people make. Well, my time is up. I hope I didn't bore you too much with the fundamental science, but I got a little outdone at when the Tennessee was playing, and I'm not knocking Tennessee or their quarterback, but they made a huge deal about Josh Dobbs being an aerospace engineer. Well, my hat's off to him. But that's, what, a rocket engine? A 2,000-acre soybean farmer is the steward of over 300 trillion plant cells, if he's growing soybeans, per acre. Each one of those cells more complicated than a jet airplane. And he's, he's got to manage that. Would you, can you imagine managing 370 trillion jet airplanes? 
It's, this complication in nature is also very, makes a, a great case for someone to say, well, when I think of a jet airplane, I think of a designer. How do you look at nature and the, how complicated the cells, living cells are and don't think of a designer? Anything you want to add? Any questions? All right. Dr. Golden.